Welcome everybody. We'll take just a minute for everybody to join on. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Hi everybody, we'll take just a minute and we will begin. All right, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Movements and Habitat Use of Wintering Snowy Owls on the Prairies with Dr. Karen Weeb. Hi, Karen. Hi. Thanks for the invitation. Nice of to be course. here. Today. Awesome. My name is Riley Davenport and I'm an educator and raptor specialist here at Hawk Mountain. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, first, I just wanna say a couple things about Hawk Mountain before we get started. Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is the world's very first sanctuary for birds of prey. We continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. And to all of our members, thank you so much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone is remaining healthy and safe during these times of COVID challenges. And we are excited to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual program just like this. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded and the video will be accessible through our YouTube channel as a continued resource. Um, once we get started today, I'll link you all to the um, YouTube channel for Hawk Mountain so you can check out some other videos we have as well. And at any time during today's program, you can submit questions down in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we have reserved some time at the end to answer some of those questions. All right, so we are so excited that Karen Weeb is joining us today to talk about her research on wintering snowy owls in Saskatchewan, Canada, which has been going on since 2013. Before we get started, I wanted to just share a little bit of background information about her before we begin. So Karen Weeb is a professor of biology at the University of Saskatchewan, specializing in the behavior and ecology of birds. And although perhaps best known in the academic world for her long-term study of northern flickers, she also has a long-standing passion for birds of prey. She studied barn owls for her honors thesis in 1988 and American kestrels for her PhD in 1993 and Eurasian kestrels for a postdoc in Finland in 1996. Her field studies on snowy owls began in 2013 when she started collaborating with two raptor banders from Saskatchewan to place satellite transmitters on wintering owls. So awesome. Thank you so much again, Karen, for joining us. Before diving in, I just wanted to ask you if you have any other um, non-snowy owl related projects or research that you wanted to share or promote with the audience? Well, I actually have a couple of projects still going on on bluebirds, mountain bluebirds out in BC, and uh, some stuff still on northern flickers also out in BC. But uh, some new research I'm interested in is actually on the snowy owl project, so I'll get to that later in the talk. Hopefully. Perfect. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. I'll let you share your screen. I'll turn off my camera and give you the floor. Okay. Let's call this up. Hopefully that's okay and everybody can see that now. Whoops. Just already got a flick back to the title slide. Okay, so those of you who heard the talk last week um, heard an interesting story from Rebecca McCabe about snowy owl behavior in Eastern North America. So you can consider this as part two on the same theme. 
uh, on snowy owls, but I'll be talking about their behavior and ecology on the Canadian prairies. So just for a bit of geographical orientation, uh, this range map shows in the red and purple color where the snowy owls breed in the high Arctic of North America. And in winter, many of them migrate south to uh, stay on the dark blue part of the map. And at the very uh, bottom part, you can see a dashed blue line, which shows a place where snowy owls are not seen every year, but maybe every four or five years during eruptions. And uh, during eruptive years, most of the owls that end up in that far southern region are immatures or yearling birds. But in the core area of their winter range in that dark blue zone, many of the birds are adults. And they occur in high densities every year. So it's a great place to study uh, the wintering behavior of these owls because there's lots of them around predictably every year. That rectangular uh, province in the center of Canada is Saskatchewan and the tip of the arrow points to the largest city in the province, which is Saskatoon, where the study was based out of. So I initially got the idea to start my own project in, uh, well, 2012, when I started hanging out with two uh, raptor banders in the province, Martin, who's shown, shown holding the snowy owl there, and Dan in the dark navy coat to his right. Um, these were both retired farmers, but had excellent skills as raptor banders and uh, were able to, to trap many owls over the years since about 2000. So through their generous efforts of time and skill, uh, they, they've been able to provide a lot of the snowy owl um, trapping data and uh, to trap owls that are being used for our studies. That year, three Norwegians also came to join us uh, they had some transmitters to put on owls, but no owls in Norway that year, whereas we had lots of owls in Saskatchewan, so this was a, a good collaboration. So this was the first winter that we put transmitters on owls in the province. Snowy owl research tends to be a collaborative effort, so uh, here's a shout out to my former PhD student, Dr. Rebecca McCabe, now of Hawk Mountain, who gave the talk last week. She came out to Saskatchewan uh, one winter to experience some snowy owl banding with us and was really great uh, to work with. And we're now continuing some collaborations together, which I'll talk about later. Uh, another person on the project was my former master's students, uh, Alex Chang. Um, and it, it's met much of his thesis data that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Yeah, so to start off with some of Alex's thesis questions, uh, we were interested in, in whether owls select a certain habitat type during winter. We presume that they would like to go to areas with high small mammal prey, and so that the quality of the habitat would be related to the small mammal abundance. And we wanted to know a little bit more about snowy owl movement patterns. We didn't know much about you know, whether they were all nomadic or did they settle down and defend territories or home ranges. So we wanted to map out the size and habitat composition of home ranges if, if they were um, settling anywhere. Uh, we were also interested in owl body condition in winter and whether there were any differences between males and females. So I don't know how many owls you can see in this photograph. 
They're kind of camouflaged against the snow, but there's actually six individuals. There's one, two, three, four, five, and one just hiding over the horizon there in the background. This photograph you can see by the date is taken in late March, uh, during a time just before the owls are um, heading back up to the Arctic for their spring migration. So in Saskatchewan, during these periods, during migration, you can see owls tolerating each other in close distances sometimes and fairly high density of owls. But as the winter goes on, we found that they tend to get more territorial and aggressive to one another as they set up. Uh, home ranges and defend them from other owls. So this nice series of photographs was given to me by uh, Paul Gaines, who's a photographer from Ontario. And it shows uh, an example of a female snowy owl with the dark black barring on her feathers, being aggressive and trying to chase a male owl off an agricultural field that uh, the female obviously thought was her uh, prime hunting territory and didn't want any intruders here. So here's the initial shot. And then there's a nice sequence of her swooping in towards the male who's now looking quite startled at the approach of those talons. And then she forcefully settles down and the male uh, quickly does a, a dodging maneuver to, to get away and, and escape being actually physically contacted by this female owl. So a lot of the aggression that we do see in winter is by females chasing away males. And if you know about raptors, you'll realize that in many species, it's the females that are actually larger than males. So they have reversed sexual size dimorphism. So in snowy owls, uh, the average weight of a female on our study area is 2,045 grams. Uh, and a male is only 1,600 or, or so grams. So he's only about 75% of the body mass of a female. So females are socially dominant over males and more aggressive in chasing males off uh, hunting areas that they want to defend. So we predicted that the habitat type used by female owls would be a better quality than what males could use. And the home range size of females we thought should be smaller because they could sustain themselves on, on a high density of prey in a really rich habitat area. We also predicted that males might be more nomadic or move around more because they might not be able to compete for the quality home ranges and that females would have better body condition. Winter in Saskatchewan is quite harsh and long. Uh, their winter temperatures can often go below 20 degrees Celsius and some days down to minus 40, which if you're familiar with the Fahrenheit scale, uh, 40 Fahrenheit and 40 Celsius is uh, pretty much the same temperature. So uh, really, really cold conditions and variable depths of snow that can last all the way from October through April. The landscape is quite flat and uh, most of it has been converted to agriculture. Whoops. Now I'm just trying to advance slides. Yeah, so the main kinds of crops growing uh, on the prairies here are canola and grain and legumes 
So lentils and peas, and there's some pasture land as well. The fields are very large. They're gridded off in about square miles. So you get large areas of the same kind of cropland. So we wanted to see if there was any difference in small mammal abundance between these four different kinds of agricultural fields and if it affected where the owls were um, setting up their territories or where they preferred to hang out in winter. So we set up these trapping grids. Uh, so we had mouse traps placed at these trapping stations uh, on 12 fields uh, per crop type. And then over a period of three nights, we counted all the mice that we uh, managed to trap in our grids. So this is what it looked like. There is a um, gravel road in Saskatchewan with one of these huge uh, grain fields extending as far as the eye can see. And a series of pink flags there marks our trapping stations uh, 30 meters apart. Well, when we looked at the data, we were surprised that there was actually no significant difference in small mammal abundance between these four kinds of crop fields. On the bottom, you can see the three years that we did our trapping. So that's fall 2004, 2015, or sorry, 2014, 15, and 16. And the number of mice varied a bit from year to year, but there were no overall differences between um, the type of crop cover that was on the fields. So that was kind of an interesting result uh, for us. Well, so then we wanted to figure out were the owls preferentially roosting or using any of those four different kinds of habitat types? So one way that we looked at the question was to start a winter roadside survey of snowy owls. So this was a 90 kilometer long or a 60 mile long uh, path of grid roads that we drove uh, every week during the winter months to count and locate every snowy owl that we could see from the edges of the roadsides. So we started doing that in 2014 and we're still doing it uh, this current winter to hopefully build up a long-term picture of things like how owl densities might change from year to year or how the timing of migration might relate to the amount of snow cover or a variety of different questions like that. So when we're doing these surveys, there's two people in a vehicle and if we see an owl, we try to see if it's a male or a female based on its plumage <clears throat> and uh, get a GPS location of the field that it's uh, sitting in. So on the map to the left, you can see, well, there's Saskatoon in the corner and the location of our focal study area and the transect is shown in that rectangular red square at the bottom. And then on the right-hand side of this slide is a map of our transect with the agricultural fields color-coded according to those four different types of agricultural land use. So we have canola, grain, legumes, and pasture lands. And I don't know if you can see the little tiny white dots on that transect, but those are examples of locations of snowy owls that we saw along this 60-mile uh, route that we drove. So we 
based on this, you can see what proportion of different cropland there is on the landscape and compare it to how many owls are being found in the different habitat types. So this graph shows in blue what you would observe or rather in red, it's showing what you would expect just by random chance if the owls were showing no preference. And the blue shows the number of owls that we actually saw in those four different habitat types. And it turns out if you do statistics on this, there were more owls seen in lentil fields than by random chance. So why might that be? Keep that question in the back of your head and hopefully we'll, I'll, I'll suggest a reason for this um, in a few slides. But simply looking at where owls are sitting is rather a coarse way to see what habitats they might be using or preferring. Uh, a much more detailed way is to put on radio uh, transmitters so you can track their movements over a 24 hour period. So this shows Martin Stoffel uh, smiling broadly because he's had a superb trapping day and uh, managed to catch two owls at the same time on the same trap, which I think this was the only time that ever happened. So uh, it was quite an exciting uh, day for all of us. So when we caught owls, uh, as part of Alex's thesis project, we put on GSM or GPS transmitters on 11 males and 12 females. And these transmitters gave us a, a geographic fix every six hours and they download data through cell phone towers. And they can give a very precise and accurate estimate of an owl's location accurate to about 10 meters. So we tracked owls over time and uh, then we uh, defined a home range as when an owl stayed in a location for a minimum of 10 days and we could calculate a minimum convex polygon. That's a technical scientific way of uh, looking at the sizes of, of home ranges of, of animals. So this is kind of a fun photograph. You can see Alex holding an owl while I'm uh, installing a transmitter as a backpack on the bird. And to help keep it calm, we have a, a toque, or I guess you uh, in the States might call it a woolen cap. You'll have to tell me what the American <coughs> word for a, for a toot is on the bird's head. Well, so this shows an example of two tracks of owls. On the left hand side, I think for, for you, we have an example of a male who traveled quite a bit during the two months of February and March in 2005. Starting at Saskatoon, he stayed a little while there on a home range, but then traveled south uh, quite a distance and settled a little longer at, an, at another location and then did a big loop around the town of Harris and Tessier there in the middle and kind of ended up inching back to Saskatoon. But yeah, was quite nomadic. And in contrast, on the right-hand side was an example of a female who stayed within a very fixed location during those same months. So if you look at, I'll show, try and show with my arrows here, if you see the towns of Harris and Tessier here, here is Harris, uh, on the same map, Harris and Tessier. So this female was located just in this little area during the whole time that the male did that huge, big movement. 
So this initially supported our idea that females would uh, be more stationary and defend the best areas and males might be more nomadic. But the more data we collected, we found out that actually females could move quite a bit uh, as well. So here is a track of another female in a different year showing similar long distance nomadic movements. So it was pretty variable from owl to owl. They just seem to have different personalities about whether they like to travel a lot or whether they like to settle. And when we um, actually looked at those core areas of high use or their home ranges, uh, Statistically, there was no difference in size between a male's home range and a female's home range. Although if you look on the graph, in the blue is the males, and you can see that their average area for a home range was quite large at about 60 square kilometers, and females did average smaller. So the pattern of the size differences was sort of consistent with what we initially thought, but there was just so much variation between individuals that it wasn't statistically uh, significant. So then once we mapped out the home ranges, we were interested if within those areas, there was evidence that owls were preferring certain habitat types. So yeah, so within their hunting territories, uh, were there like differences between males and females in the types of home ranges they set up? So we went to where we uh, had mapped out on the landscape where the owl was located and looked at the crop types in the fields uh, within its home range. And again, coded them to those four different kinds of fields, canola fields, grain, legume fields, and pasture land. And we did find that female owls, so this F stands for female, on average, they had less canola um, fields in their home ranges than males. So that suggests that maybe canola is poor habitat because if the females are dominant and they can establish their ranges where they want to and they're avoiding canola, you know, maybe the males are forced into these ranges with more canola crops. So keep the question in the back of your mind again. So why might canola be a poor area for owls and legume fields be a good area? And then we also look to see where owls were concentrating on the home ranges. And in the case of females, they were sort of randomly distributed all over the different crop types, but the males sort of squished into the uh, few legume fields that were possible in the areas that they stayed at. So why might that be? Because we found out before that there was no difference in the number of mice between these different kinds of crop fields. So it wasn't like it was um, a question of the actual abundance of prey, but then we thought maybe it's because the structure of the stubble left on these agricultural fields might affect the hunting success of the owls. So these three photographs show the same taxidermy mount of a stuffed owl placed in, a, in a three different kinds of crop fields here. 
For the one with the canola stubble, those stalks are very tall and thick. They're almost like tree branches, very hard and stiff. And you can imagine that if an owl is diving down on a mice, on a mouse in such a field, it could easily impale itself and probably injure itself if it hit one of those stalks with a lot of speed. In comparison, a grain stubble is a lot softer and more flexible. So it's probably easier for an owl just to uh, swoop down and uh, snatch a mouse from here without much risk of injury to itself. But easiest of all seems to be the legume fields. So in these lentil and pea fields, the vegetation structure left after harvest is quite thin and sparse. So this might make it easy, easier to detect uh, small mammals moving around and certainly easier to chase and probably catch them uh, with less effort for snowy owls. So this is the reason why we think owls are showing an avoidance of canola and a preference for legume habitats. So overall, um, we could say that all of the owls did settle down at least for brief periods of time during the winter to establish a home range, but 77% of them left at some point and traveled around um, nomadically, or they might have settled down at a new home range somewhere else. Overall, there was no difference between the sexes in the time they spent on home ranges or the distance that they traveled <clears throat> while off a home range. So we were also interested in looking at the body condition of owls and how they might be uh, doing um, during these harsh and cold winters on the prairie. So when we trapped owls, we aged them by looking at the molt patterns on their feathers so we could tell if they were first year birds or adult birds and we could also sex them based on the barring patterns on the plumage. And then we took various measurements of them like wing length, um, body size, and also body mass measurements by weighing them in this uh, metal canister here. And we found that adults were heavier on average than juvenile yearling birds. And that was true for both sexes. And maybe that's not too surprising because the juvenile birds are not very experienced hunters yet. They're just learning in their first winter of life. And so they might have more difficulty keeping up uh, high fat stores than adults do. There was an also no effect of date during the winter season that the owls were trapped. So this meant that on average, owls were successfully maintaining their body mass throughout the whole winter and not declining. Um, so that was uh, a fairly sort of reassuring finding for us that these were not sort of desperate and uh, owls as suffering in winter, but for the most part, they could find enough food to keep their body mass stable during the winter season. We also looked at sick and injured owls that were being turned in to vet colleges and rehab centers on the prairies in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. The vets at these places classified the reason that owls were admitted for treatment, uh, either based on trauma, which was collisions, mostly with vehicles, but also owls hitting electrical wires um, or buildings or other sorts of impacts. Some owls were turned in very skinny and emaciated and others had signs of disease. 
if you look at the body mass of these different types of owls, on the uh, left-hand side of the graph, it shows the individuals that we trapped alive out in the field. The red bars are of the females and they are consistently heavier than the smaller males, which you might expect. But you can see that on average, the live trapped yearling birds were slightly uh, lighter than the live trapped adult birds out in the field. But of the owls turned into the vet clinic, uh, the ones that just had impacts, they weren't in too rough shape uh, in terms of body mass. So uh, they were about the same as the live trap juveniles. But once you started looking at the diseased owls, there was evidence that they were lighter in body mass. And of course, the owls that were emaciated were substantially lighter than owls that we were trapping naturally um, on average uh, on our study site. But then we were curious about the sex ratio of these birds. Because if you look at the numbers here, it means that we found that 42 of the emaciated owls were males and only 25 of them were females. So how does that sex ratio of owls compare to what was occurring um, out out in the wild. So if we calculated the percentage of males of those that we saw on our transect census, about 45% of them were males. And if you looked at the owls that were injured by trauma, it was pretty much the same sex ratio. But as you got to birds that were showing more and more nutritional stress, so signs of disease or these emaciated owls, the sex ratio of these birds that were kind of hard up were more male biased. Um, so this suggests to us that Owls that migrate to winter on the prairies are usually in pretty good body condition. And like I said, for the most part, they don't seem to be having problems keeping up their body mass. But there is a component of the population um, that, that does not do well. And so it's probably the uh, subdominance of the males and their use of these inferior habitats that in some cases might lead to a lower body mass and a greater likelihood of starvation, um, especially for the yearling owls without much experience. So to shift gears and talk about a totally different topic, one that has, has to do with displaying in, in birds, um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to see a snowy owl, but if you look at them, um, often they are facing the sun. So they're orienting their bodies towards the sun. So my PhD supervisor, Gary Bordelotti, noticed this, and he thought that it might be a way that owls were signaling by making the front of themselves shine brightly in the sunlight. So he published this paper in 2011 in the journal IBIS, uh, suggesting that wintering snowy owls uh, orient themselves to maximize visual displays, visual territorial displays to other owls. Well, I guess you're allowed to be skeptical of your PhD supervisor, if he's your friend. So I have to say that I was always a little bit skeptical to this displaying idea, because if a male owl is white all around his body, then he should be reflective and shine no matter what direction the angle of the sun is coming from. And there were a few other reasons 
that made me think that maybe temperature or uh, thermal regulation might be another way to explain why owls were orienting to the sun. So I decided to do another study and look at how owls oriented to the sun, but this time measure wind speeds and ambient temperature and look at the height above the ground that the owls were perching to see if this might be explained by uh, thermoregulation. So on our study area, there's some places with really high power lines. And uh, if you look carefully, uh, you might be able to see a bunch of snowy owls perched way high up there. There's one on this pole, another one way down there. And if you look down here, there's even a really faint white dot, another one perched down there too. So sometimes they perch really high up. Other times they can be content just to sit on the ground. And other times they perch somewhere in between on fence posts or what's ever available to them. So it turned out that the way that the snowy owls orient, whether to the sun or to the wind, depends a lot on the speed of the wind and on the ambient temperature. So as the graph shows here, as the winds get more and more intense, the the uh, black squares show the probability that the owl will turn to face the wind goes up and the probability that it turns to face the sun goes down. And this makes sense because an owl doesn't want its feathers to ruffle up in the wind because that really destroys the insulation ability of its thick feather coat. So by facing into the wind, it keeps sleek and it helps to keep the body heat in. And we also found that owls uh, perching high up um, off the ground decreased as the wind speeds increased. So again, trying to get out of wind chill, they move from the high up perches to sitting on the ground when it's in really windy conditions. And although you think an owl might be well insulated by its feather plumage, and it certainly is, around here by its face, around its eyes and bill, there's still areas of thin feathers where it can lose body heat. So it seemed to us that by facing the sun, it was still a way that an owl can collect some heat and solar radiation on the part of its body that's most um, exposed to heat loss. So Alex and I published a paper in the same journal a few years later called Seeing Sunlit Owls in a New Light, Orienting Snowy Owls May Not Be Displaying. And we think it actually has more to do with ambient temperature. So just to wrap things up, um, I thought I'd highlight some current and future questions that I'm excited to address with the snowy owl data. Now that we've had transmitters on owls for many years, we can see if they come back year after year to the same area. So that's um, a question about whether they are phylopatric to their winter ranges. And we can also start to look at their migration tracks and follow their movements to the, to the whole annual cycle as they're on the prairies and then traveling up to their Arctic breeding grounds. So here is a map that I believe shows about 12 individual owls, each plotted in a different color. They were all initially radioed here in central, south central Saskatchewan. And then it shows one migration track per owl as it heads up north, 
uh, trying to breed somewhere in the Arctic. And then as it's returning down uh, the following year to overwinter. Now, uh, one thing that we found is that of the owls that we've radioed and come back, they're all returning to the same sort of south central area of the province. They aren't ranging very widely, you know, south into the states or over to the Great Lakes or to the west. They seem to like to come back to roughly the same area that they were initially trapped in, which is kind of interesting because we know on the breeding grounds, they're very nomadic and follow uh, hot spots of lemmings in the high Arctic and uh, breed in very different locations from summer to summer. So they wander a lot more in, in the summer period in the tundra than they seem to do, relatively speaking, in the winter season. If you look at just a single owl, whoops, so this is an example of a female owl called Bitey, who's come back, uh, how many years now? One, two, three, four, five, she's come back seven winters. Uh, and you can see the pattern here. So each of her winters is in a different color code. Again, she's like coming back to pretty similar general areas uh, and then ranges quite a bit in the Arctic during, during the summer. And in recent years has been following almost the same exact migration trail all the way back south to um, a wintering area on the prairies. So this is just early days. Um, Rebecca McCabe and I have just started crunching the numbers and plotting these graphs for some of these owls. And we're really keen to see if there's any patterns. So again, whether female owls might be more consistent and predictable in their migration tracks and home ranges than males. But uh, hopefully we'll come up with some answers in the next uh, few weeks and uh, solve a few of these mysteries. So this is a plot of Bites home ranges in three consecutive years in 2007, 2008. These blobs are the core hunting areas she was hanging out in. Here's a scale for reference of about 10 kilometers. So some of these areas can be pretty big. And in some years, a few of the owls seem to come back to the same home ranges uh, from year to year. But this seems to be a minority of owls so far. So Bitey was the only one out of five female owls that came back to a core hunting area. And out of seven males that returned, only three of them ended up coming back to the same home range. And the others just went to different, slightly different locations on, on the prairie. So not all of the owls are tur turning out to be very consistent. So uh, I guess that wraps up what I have to uh, share with you today. Um, owls are very interesting and mysterious birds. And like many questions in science, you realize that the more you can answer, uh, the more questions seem to pop up and the more mysteries there are still to solve. So I'm looking forward to uh, many more years of studying snowy owls and to un uncovering more things that we still don't know about what they're doing. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Karen. I love this ending photo. What a great shot. Um, so I do have a couple questions from our viewers that I'd like to go through. Um, the first one is actually, I think you read their mind because this was asked a little bit earlier in the program, but they asked if birds that settled or were nomadic repeated that same individual behavior year after year. So it sounds like that's kind of in progress currently. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and something that hopefully Rebecca and I can nail down in the next couple of weeks. So you'll have to stay, stay tuned to a uh, future update. Um, but 
Yes, it does. Like of the owls that are coming back, they tend to do so repeatedly year after year. So they're, they're kind of showing a consistent behavior, like whether you want to call it a personality trait or a fixed behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and then other owls that have come back seven years and are nomadic all of those seven years. Uh, yeah, so the causes behind that, we're not quite sure yet. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting to note some consistency in, in behaviors in the early days of looking at these data anyways. Definitely. All right, my next question is from Virgil and Kathy Troyer, and they asked, did snow cover negate the stubble advantages that you were talking about earlier? Um, we looked at it in a couple of different years, and we still found avoidance of, of canola fields. Um, but it's a good question. Like, we don't know how well like owls can judge the depth of the stubble below the, the snow cover. But maybe after a few pounces, they can sort of see that um, if they land through the soft snow, like those canola stalks are, are still there and they're, they're, they're gonna be a danger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think with with a few hunting attempts, they they kind of probably adjust their perception of how deep the snow is and how tall the stubble is relative to that. Mm -hmm. This next question is from Earl Stafford, and they asked, "What diseases are snowy owls susceptible to?" That I don't have a great answer. To two because I didn't actually look at the vet reports to see what they were analyzing for. I think they were mostly looking for signs of parasites and perhaps uh, bacterial infections uh, somewhere in, in the organs of, of the owls that they were doing necropsies on. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there, there wasn't avian flu or some of these other um, sort of diseases that people are, are kind of worried about these days. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the best answer that I can give. Sure thing. All right, next up, this question is from Janet Hill and they asked, thanks for your presentation. Do snowy owls mate for life? Do they spend summer together and split up for the winter? Yeah, oh, that's, um, that's something we're still getting more information on, but lots of them, I think, don't make for life uh, because they seem to migrate um, as individuals. And the areas where lemmings are um, dense and active in the Arctic vary so much from year to year that uh, they uh, head up north and they just start scouting around for a lemming hotspot, not knowing where their mate of a previous year might be. So she might be searching all over the Arctic in one direction and he's searching all over the Arctic in, in the other direction. So the chances of them sticking together for a lifetime are, are pretty small. Right. Um, this next question, I they asked, which owls did you say tend to migrate south of those normal winter range? Yeah, so those owls tend to be mostly yearling birds or immatures. Hmm. So it's thought that in years of high productivity in the Arctic, when there's lots of juveniles being pr produced and lemmings are, are really good, there's just a, a ton of immature owls around um, that maybe are not so good at defending territories or hunting in the Arctic and they're just moving south and are, are um, traveling to these more kind of marginal southern habitats than, than typically. But yeah, it's, it's mostly the immature owls that do those uh, long southward eruptive movements. Mm. Um, this question is from Diane, and she asked um, if you are aware of anyone currently looking at rodenticide impacts in snowy owls. Uh, 
I think there are some people with Project Snowstorm here in the East that are taking tissue samples like uh, liver and, and other tissues and looking for various kinds of pesticides. I don't know specifically whether they're looking at rodenticides, but I do know that, yeah, it, it is a concern that um, many of these birds of prey are, are picking up um, rodenticides and, and this, this can have an, an impact. Um, out, out on the prairies where we study them, um, and especially in, in winter, there's, there's not much application of, of rodenticides. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem to be an issue um, on, the, in, on the Canadian prairies so much. But I know like certainly here in more Southern locations, yeah, it, it is probably a, a critical feature to look into. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, I have two questions left for you. The first one is, do owls that sometimes winter in Canada ever drift from those breeding grounds around the pole to winter either in Europe or Russia? Um, so far, there's no evidence that they move over. An exception is a few owls that were tagged far west in Alaska. They, they could migrate a little bit further west uh, into Siberia. So there does seem to be a little bit of migratory connectivity uh, between the Aleutians on, in Alaska and Siberia. But in Eastern North America, um, owls don't seem to cross the Atlantic and move into Europe uh, that direction. Awesome. And then our final question for you is, is there a way or website that the audience can follow if they're interested in following Tag Snowy Owls? Uh, probably the best website would be the Project Snowstorm website that has regular updates uh, for owls tagged here in eastern North America. And they do a really good job of mapping and, and plotting and, and uh, giving interesting updates on owl movements. In central and western North America, there's nothing I know of where, where these things are uploaded online on on a website not, not just yet all righty well i just linked the project snowstorm website in the chat if anyone would like to check that out um and i just had one final question come in that says thanks so much very interesting and learned a lot so mm -hmm. karen thank you so much for joining us today and thank you everyone for joining us both this week and last week for our little snowy owl series it's been such a pleasure um, I wanted to share if anyone um, is local to Hawk Mountain, we do have some programs coming up. We do yoga on the mountain every Sunday, um, like the final Sunday of every month, if you'd like to check that out, and a bunch of art workshops. You can just go to hawkmountain.org and check out our calendar of events. Um, thank you all so much for wonderful questions. Karen, anything you'd like to leave us with before we head out? Ah, uh, no, I think, uh, I think that's good. Awesome. All right. Well, great. thank you again for joining us. Thank you, everyone. And have a great night. Great. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye, everybody.